Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and for the opportunity to gather together to worship you, to learn from your word, and to be guided by your spirit. We just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would guide us during this study, that it would help us to know our Lord and Savior more, uh, to be able to love him more dearly, to see him more clearly, and to follow him more nearly all the days of our life. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Oh. Huh? Yeah. It's, and it's actually even in the back of our book. Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. It's actually, oh, I can't remember who, but in the back of our service booklet, because it's in the new prayer book. Yeah. And so it's in there as well. Oh, do they? Yeah. Oh, all right. You know, you don't necessarily need the binder right now. All right. So, today we are looking at uh, the family trade. So, in an older day, um, your uh, opportunities for employment uh, often weren't a choice, right? You, if your father was a carpenter, you were raised up and you were going to be a carpenter. That was the family trade. It's what you did. Um, as members of Christ's body, there is a family trade, right? And so we're looking at today the nature and the mission of the church. We'll see that it can be expressed many different ways, but we all have a, a certain practice of life that we are called into. Okay. All right, Chris, can we go to the next one, please? All right. Who has, oh wait, but then we have this. All right, I'll just read this. So, Anglican spirituality. The pattern of the Christian life can be seen as one of repentant faith. Okay, so we turn away from the things that draw us away from God and we turn back to God. Um, and this is the pattern until Christ returns. There will be forces both internally and externally that seek to draw us away from God's love. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Thus, we need to be attentive to the Holy Spirit and hear his call for us to return home when we go astray. As we watch and wait for Christ's return, God has given us means of grace, the word, sacraments, fellowship, prayer, and service, to cultivate our faith by abiding in him so that we may resist evil and live fruitful lives for the good of others and for God's glory. So it's interesting, it's for the good of others and for God's glory. The focus isn't on necessarily us and how we feel, though God does care about that, but the pattern of God's life is that as we live following Jesus who poured out his life for others, we will be the best version of ourselves. We'll actually experience more peace. We'll, we'll have more emotional stability um, when we follow the pattern of Christ's life. That means we have to become aware of our emotions and learn how to process them and deal with them. But um, ultimately, we're trained as consumers to see what is in it for me. And the Christian life is really what is in it for others through me. Okay. All right. So uh, the other thing I didn't mention this last week, it just came to me. I, I had a, Michelle and I had a mentor who said something that's always stuck with me is that we are called to be able to discern the many voices of the flesh from the Holy Spirit's voice, right? Because we all have what we can refer to as a committee in our head sometimes that, remember, it's not always building us up, right? If, if we're starting to get the sense of accusation and that we're not doing enough, we talked about that's one of the, the enemy's tactics, right? Um, and so we can have these different voices in our head, but we want to hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And it's always invitational. It's always an invitation to a deeper relationship. Even when we sin, it's this invitation to come home. Come home, not you bleepity bleep, how could you do that again? I'm so disappointed. It's like, no, come home. Come back to the feast, okay? 
So that's the pattern of the Christian life, repentant faith. Remember, when we repent, we recognize, we return to the Lord, and then we rejoice. We give thanks that we're already cleansed, healed, forgiven, and we pray for more cleansing and more healing so that we can experience that forgiveness anew and afresh. So it's always coupled with thanksgiving. Okay, the next one, Chris, please. All right, um, Anglican spirituality is said to be incar incarnational as it refuses to separate the secular from the sacred, the head from the heart, the Protestant from the Catholic, the word from the sacrament, and the church gathered, which is what we've been doing today, from the church sent, which is what we'll talk about today. The Bible drives all truly Christian spirituality and our heritage has historically used the prayer book as a means to help us grow in living into the story um, and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so next one, Chris. Um, so this, is, we're just gonna review, because remember we didn't have enough time last week to talk briefly about these things. Um, did anybody try um, the trinitymission.org? Okay, one person, great. Okay, that is the daily spoken office, right? So it's going to be morning prayer and evening prayer um, that'll be spoken. Um, I encourage you to download the app, um, which is, I think, daily office 2019 onto your phone. And that has morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, and Compline with the Bible readings already there, with the ESV, and you can have the, um, you can do the audio form of the ESV, and you can make choices about how you use it, but it, it gives you um, a real easy way to try out prayer book uh, spirituality, okay? Um, I think it's Daily Office 2019, or BCP 2019. Daily Office 2019, okay. So the review of the church year, um, I gave you a little handout that built on this a little bit more in two visuals. So one, um, what Michael Spencer said is it enables us to live into God's story because we're going through the story of the gospel every year. Uh, it keeps the main thing the main thing, Jesus Christ. Uh, it recognizes that one's calendar forms one's life. Okay. So we really, like for us, you know, the preparation for Christmas is going to begin right after Thanksgiving. Not about buying gifts, but about entering into a season of preparation referred to as Advent, where we begin to prepare for Jesus' second coming, right? We'll look at some of the prophecies about his second coming. And we do this to remind ourselves to stay awake and um, alive to Christ because he could come back any moment. And that's how we prepare to celebrate his first advent, which is Christmas. Um, then we'll celebrate Christmas, the incarnation, for, anybody know how many days? There's a song about it, Partridge in a Pear Tree, 12 Days of Christmas. Yeah, that's what that song's actually about, <laughs> is that the church has historically celebrated Christmas for 12 days, not one day, okay? Um, then from that, we're going to go into Epiphany, where we're going to recognize that Jesus came to fulfill what God had said, that the whole world would be blessed through the seed of Abraham. So it begins by looking at the revelation of Jesus to the world. And does anybody know which figures that we often celebrate as if it happened on Christmas Eve, but it didn't, um, weren't Jews? The wise men. Right? They were Gentiles from a pagan land studying you know, the pagan art of astronomy. Right? Um, they, they got to Jesus a couple years after his birth. Right? Um, so um, then we're going to go in from there into Lent, where now we're preparing again for um, Jesus' resurrection. So it's going to be the times in purple are times of penitence, where we're going to be reflecting on Lord, show us what ways in us are amiss, right? Because we want to fully in, enter into these big feast days, 
Okay, um, and so we're going to go through the crucifixion, then we go into the season of Easter, where we'll have the resurrection, um, and anybody know how long the season of Easter is? Forty-eight Sundays. Oh, four to eight. Oh, four to eight Sundays. Oh, no, that, that's okay. So I am. Where did? So that's Christmas. I'm down here at Easter. So if you look on the back, it's fifty days. So it was 50, Jesus was with the disciples for fifty days before he ascended, right? Then we celebrate Pentecost, right? Which is the birth of the uh, the church, the outpouring of the Spirit. Short season, then we go into the season, which can be referred to ordinary time, the season after Pentecost. Uh, some refer to it in the season of the Trinity because um, it happens, you know, after Trinity Sunday. Okay, so every high point in Jesus' life and in the teaching of the church is commemorated and celebrated. Green means growth, and so... During that time, we'll rotate each year between looking at one of Jesus' Gospels um, and the growth that the Holy Spirit brings to the church. Okay? So, yep. uh-huh. and so I always start at the Christmas story because that's the mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. Ordinary time. Is after Pentecost and before. So right now, okay. we would be in ordinary time. Right, okay. Okay. And that's because that app is from the Jesuits in Britain, which are Catholic, and they refer to it specifically as ordinary time. We re usually refer to it as the season after Pentecost, right? Or the season um, after the Trini you know, Trinity Sunday, okay? So, um, but it's this sense of, how many of you have a calendar on your phone? How many of it gives you little reminders? Beep, 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 okay. So, what uh, he wrote in there is that it, one's calendar, right, defines and forms one's life, right? And so if we live into the church calendar, which when we do like the, the daily office, the readings often will be structured by season. The prayers certainly will be like the colics. Um, it helps us to remember what calendar we're really called to live by. Okay, um, most of the things on our calendar right now are not going to matter a month from now, right? But this truth here is going to matter throughout eternity, okay? And so we're really wanting to structure our lives to where it's taking precedence, okay? Um, it links personal spirituality with worship, family, and community, right? That we're, as a congregation, we're going through this, right? And if we're doing... Uh, you know, um, worship with our family, that connects. And then we, even how we can look out into the world, right? Um, and it provides a basis of unity and common experience for Christians everywhere, right? The, you know, to not follow the church calendar is a newer invention. And when I mean newer, like, you know, up until 500 years ago, everybody did it. It's a cool thing, you know. Um, but, you know, with the Reformation came, you know, a movement away from this certain tradition and pattern. And so a lot of churches want to stay so focused on the Bible, right, Bible-based, non-denominational churches that they, you know, this type of thing is foreign to them, right? But then actually we have to question, you know, having a topic in which you select from different parts of the Bible to preach throughout the year that seems kind of foreign to the Bible, right? Which is a whole narrative and a whole story revealing a whole life, okay? All right, uh, next one, Chris, please. All right, so this, I had you read two things, the Anglican ethos and the Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral. So real quick, uh, you know, kind of the essence of being an Anglican is this sense that there's a via media, a center way between radical Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. Right, so to say we're Reformed Catholics would be, um, you know, it's often been a phrase used. Uh, common worship, that we follow a, a pattern of common worship. You're not going to be surprised 
going to any Anglican church in the world unless they've really departed from the liturgy. So like I could say, for example, it used to be I was raised at St. John's Lutheran, right? Um, they have departed such that if you go to their main service, I would, I, you know, I, I have, I don't recognize that as how I was raised in the church because they used to be more liturgical, right? It, it's more rare to have an Anglican church like separate that much from, you know, the liturgy. So there's this common worship that holds us together and a comprehensiveness, right? We desire to embrace the different ways the church has expressed itself throughout scripture. So there's that top cross, the evangelical, right? It's this um, acknowledgement that there's a transcendent God and yet he's given us his objective word, okay? So that's what we mean by evangelical. There's a strong sense for, you know, sharing the gospel with the world. Okay, um, on the bottom side of that, we have uh, holiness, right? That God is imminent. He's not just transcendent, but through his spirit, he's everywhere. And he comes to us and we have a subjective response to him. We actually encounter God and we respond to him, right? Anybody know which Anglican really pushed that forward? Sadly, it was so threatening, we kind of pushed him out. Um, John Wesley, he, he was an Anglican. Um, and so, you know, the holiness movement that you often hear of started within Anglicanism in that sense with John Wesley. Okay. Um, then on the outer poles, you have missional, right, and Anglo-Catholic. So Anglo-Catholic, just simplified, is the church gathered, right, the sense of beautiful worship, um, the acknowledgement of God in our, our midst and the world being sacramental um, and sharing those sacraments. And then on the other side, it's missional, right? The church dispersed, sharing the gospel with the world. Okay, so this is um, a, a way to kind of understand what we're trying to hold together um, in Anglicanism. A lot of denominations will just kind of focus on one of these, right? And, and we're trying to hold them all together. Okay. Um, then the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, if you saw that in the uh, late 1800s, there was this desire and attempt within the Anglican Church to see the whole church reunited, right? Based upon Jesus' prayer in John 17 that we all may be one, um, there was this sense of, hey, we're on things that are non-essential, we're willing to forego um, the things that we've held to in order to be in unity. But these are the things that had to be present, they said. is one, we acknowledge anybody's a member of the universal church if they've been baptized in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Then um, the unity is based on this. If we can all agree of the authority of Scripture... If we can all look at the Nicene Creed and say, hey, this is a foundational summary of the faith. There's a lot more to it, but if we can agree on what the Nicene Creed says, we, we can be one. Um, then that we agree on the gospel sacraments, right? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then the historic episcopate, meaning that God, ha God is an orderly God. He has created structures for us to be under authority. So the laying on of hands of the apostles to the original deacons and then to the, the you know, presbyters after that, that we have this sense that um, bishops, you know, priests pre or pastors and deacons is the way the church was designed to function. Okay. So obviously it didn't work. I mean, the, their desire was not received. But what do you think was the, uh, the sticking point of those four essentials? No. Nope. People didn't have a problem with the baptism. Huh? No, nope, they, were, they were okay on those first two. Or the authority of Scripture... Nicene Creed, I think everyone was okay with the baptism, 
but it's this sense, I think, of the need for bishops, right? That you have to have a bishop, right? Because some people are very afraid of, well, then does that mean you have a pope? And, you know, so there's that. And then also, like I shared, you know, up until the Reformation, there was never any doubt in anybody's mind that, you know, the Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist, there was something taking place there beyond comprehension that it was a real means of God's grace, that the Spirit was active and present. It was after that that people started to go, you know what, I don't, I don't think that's what Jesus meant. And so for, you know, they're like, hey, if we're going to all be one, we really need to get our, our understanding of the Lord's Supper together. And I think that's where they also kind of hit Okay. But it shows, the reason why I share that is it shows the impulse within Anglicanism to actually want to, to all come together. Okay. All right, let's move forward, Chris, please. All right, briefly share with your neighbor what church is in your own words and what the mission of the church is. Anybody want to share their definition of the church? Jane does? Okay. Very good. I'm going to take off our mic here. Okay. Okay, good. We'll we'll get to that. All right. What what did you say? Church. Well, I'm actually more comfortable on the mission of the church. Right. So isn't there a saying that says um, as Christians, our role is to glorify glorify the Lord and enjoy him forever? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So but that would be the, you know, the way that stated is what is the purpose and chief end of man? And that is to know and enjoy God and glorify him forever. Okay. Yeah. So, but that, that's the chief end of man. So, and how do we do that? There's a lot of different ways, right? But primarily one. So like the mission of the church is to share the love of Christ with the world, right? That they may know him, right? Um, what, what's the definition of the church? And there's no single right answer. I'll show you in a moment that scripture refers to several images. We thought it was or I said it was the people. Very good. It's the people, not the building, right? So what makes All Saints so awesome isn't our awesome digs, <laughs> right? It's all of you, right? So, um, you know, and that's, that's the reality. I mean, to think that we need a beautiful cathedral in order to worship God is a gross misunderstanding of Scripture, right? But it is beautiful. Don't get me wrong. Yep. Uh, the church. The church. It's not just Anglicans. Oh, absolutely not. Right. Yep. No. Nope. So that's good. The, the, we want to distinguish between the universal church and the visible church. Okay. So the universal church represents all people who have placed their hope and trust in Christ alone throughout all time and in all places. That's what we're a part of. Okay. 
the Anglican denomination is one way of living into that. It is not the way, right? I think the first class I said, if I'm put to the test, I would like to die for Jesus, but I'm not going to die for the Anglican church, right? Dying for Jesus would be to die for the universal church, right? Um, and so, but there's also the sense of the visible church, which is what most non-believers will focus on. Right? They're going to focus on the organization, the institution, the corruption, the fact that sinners are still a part of the church, which we know we are. Our very liturgy reminds us of that, but we're forgiven. Right? So the, the kingdoms of men will look at the church like any other institution, and they're going to see faults uh, because there's no sin-free zone area in the world, right? even in the church. So we should do everything that we can to be as healthy of an organization to present a different picture of the world to, you know, those who are outside the church. That's what we actively seek to try to do. And that's where we just need to really, um, kind of like that, repentant faith. We need to acknowledge where we're wrong, turn back to the Lord, and if we've harmed people in the midst, you know, to make it right. Christians should be the first ones to admit that they don't have it all together. Right. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this, looking at the, the church, the way it's defined in the New Testament, sheep in Christ's flock, citizens of God's kingdom, brothers and sisters in God's family, stones in God's living temple, um, branches of Jesus' vine, and members of God's body. Okay. Um, John Stott, the great evangelical Anglican, said, we belong irrevocably to one another because we belong irrevocably to him. Okay. If you look at most of those have a very organic nature. It's about being connected to something. The New Testament doesn't know or present anything about um, being a Christian without being a body, a part of a body, without being a part of a local congregation. Like to them, that would be like, oh, that's like foreign. That, that actually isn't the way things are structured. Okay? So here's, here's one of my illustrations I like. Well, being a part of a church um, can bring its challenges, Right? Um, and those challenges can serve a great purpose if we're up for it. But uh, one author talked about putting together a bunch of beautiful or um, raw gemstones, okay? And before you get like the real beauty out of the gemstones, you know what they do? They put them in a pouch and they put it in a shaker and it shakes all the gemstones together and knocks off their rough edges and smooths them out. We are those rough gemstones. The church is the shaker, right? And, and so that means that if we're really going to live in relationship in the body of Christ, we should expect conflict, we should expect dysfunction, but we should actively be committed to living out what Jesus teaches us on how to deal with conflict, how to deal with dysfunction, how to extend grace and forgiveness and mercy and seek restoration. That's the only way we're going to really um, be healthy as followers. And so if you think about that, if I'm a rough stone and my m God's goal for me is to be smoothed out and I'm making a commitment never to be a part of the body of Christ, but I'm just going to follow Jesus, well, then we're going to be falling short of what he's designed. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one, please, Chris. Oh, good. Video. Churches are full of people. The broken, the lonely, the wanderers, the hopeful, the enthusiastic, the lost, the passionate, and the faithful. For many that Yeah, let's pause it for a moment until we get that worked out.
Churches are full of people. The broken, the lonely, the wanderers, the hopeful, the enthusiastic, the lost, the passionate, and the faithful. For many, this gathering represents the whole of their church experience. They'll listen attentively to a message, they'll sing a few songs, they'll be invited to pray, and then they'll return to their lives. But for some, questions will start bubbling to the surface of their faith. Is this the extent of what Jesus intended for his followers? Who is the church for? Why does the world need the church, and what is the church after all? Well, the church isn't the building where people attend weekly services. It's not a program, a list of rules, or a philosophy. The church isn't a political affiliation, a country club, or a holiday tradition. The church was never intended to be just an assembly of people wearing nice clothes and saying nice things. The church is all the followers of Jesus everywhere. The Greek word for church is the word ekklesia. It's the combination of two words, ek, which means out, and kaleo, meaning called. Thus, the church, the ecclesia, means the called out ones. In other words, the church, the collective body of all the followers of Jesus everywhere, is called out by someone for something, for a purpose. The beginning of the book of Acts has Jesus calling his disciples to a task, bringing something called the gospel, the good news, to all the world. And this gospel would go out to all the outsiders, the forgotten, the abandoned, and the excluded. And they, those outsiders, would see and receive that good news as actually good. And when Jesus talked about the gospel, it was always in conjunction with something else, something called the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, God's purposes are made apparent. There's justice and righteousness. There's hope for the poor and for the oppressed. And under the kingdom of God, mercy and forgiveness take precedence over bitterness and resentment. Now, people previously deemed to be far from God are brought into his family, adopted as his sons and daughters. And the fullness of the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, is not merely expressed as a way for people to escape an evil world when they die. Rather, the good news of God's kingdom is about the announcement of God's eternity moving into the present world and carrying on into the life to come. The people who belong to Jesus join him in his worldwide restoration project. And the called out ones, the church, are committed to advancing this good news of God's kingdom into the world. Not as a means of helping people avoid the world, but rather to see God's kingdom life being made real here and now. The whole church with the power of the whole gospel for the whole world. Right. Thank you, Chris, for getting that worked out. All right. So what did you guys think of the whiteboard church? That's good, isn't it? Okay. So um, I love watching presentations like that. They make things so simple. But simple is not always easy, right? But we have to continue to be reminded of the truth so that we will be allow ourselves to be moved and take up courage and step out in the direction that our lives are meant to go, okay? Um, so that came from the Lasan Covenant, which was this worldwide evangelist, uh, like, uh, what's that called? Ecumenical, meaning all denominations kind of came together and said, how can we really kind of bring the gospel to the world? And so that's what they came up with, the saying the whole church bringing the whole gospel to the whole world. Now, was there anything missing from that presentation that you could think of? Okay. So there's aspects of that presentation that I believe we struggle with, right? Like getting out, right? Um, That we struggle with finding ways to share the love of Christ that connect with people, right? Right? Um, we, we struggle with um, that, that whole movement, right? We can get stuck in what they were describing initially of coming together once a week for fellowship and, and for that. But the truth that what we need is we really need to worship, right? And that's the one thing that's missing there. It's like out of worship, are we equipped to go out into the world? Um, there are ways that, uh, and 
some people have been so committed to the going out part um, that they ended up trampling over people and also trampling over their families, right? Um, and so for us, everything begins with worship because we're giving thanks, we're offering ourselves and receiving what we need to go out, right? So there's a real balance there. Our tradition, um, well, I, I can just say, areas for growth at All Saints is to do more going out, right? Um, throughout the history of the Anglican Church, there was a lot of um, going out at times, right? Um, so we, we have a great history of it. We have a great history of it within our own congregation. We just always want to have that balance, okay? All right, let's go to the next one, please, Chris. All right, so the church gathered for worship, right? Uh, the kind of theological founder of our tradition, Thomas Cranmer, his whole deal in setting up the liturgy in the prayer book was so that the, our hearts would be renewed with the power to love, right? That um, we would so encounter the Holy Spirit through worship and through the sacrament and through God's word that our hearts would be renewed to be able to actually love God with all that we are and love our neighbors as ourselves, okay? And you know, Jesus kind of ratcheted that up in the Gospel of John. He didn't just say, love your neighbors as yourself. What did he say? Well, he said, love your enemies, but he said, love your neighbors as I love you. Okay, right? That means we've got to be willing to pour out our lives for other people's lives, okay? So we gather together to be renewed in the power of love and then so that we can be the church sent on mission. And so the way to understand, you know, from the New Testament perspective, mission is sharing the love of God through the gospel, that's what the Great Commission's about, right? The good news, I love that little um, signpost, right? Los Angeles, 45 miles, and then God was like infinity, but in Christ, it's now zero, right? To share the love that God is actually for us. He's for all of creation, and that it doesn't require work and effort. It just requires admitting our need, right? All we need is need, and that's what most people don't want. I don't want to be needy. I don't want to be weak. I don't want to have to have a savior, right? But that's, that's, what, that, that's the message of the gospel, okay? And we need to be known by our love in all spheres of our lives, right? So I can't behave like a Christian in worship on Sunday and then go to work and chew people out. Well, I may go chew them out because I'm human, but as a Christian, then I should go back and seek reconciliation and admit, you know what, that was wrong. Can you forgive me? How can I make that up to you? Right? Because if people don't see that we're willing to walk in the ways of Jesus, do you think they're going to want to hear about Jesus? No. Okay. Um, and so we have the Sermon on the Mount, too, which says we are called to be salt and light. Salt preserves and it also adds flavor. Light casts out darkness. These are kind of the qualities of our lives that we're looking for, okay? All right, let's move to the next one, please. Okay, so I think I put in here this now in the 1979 prayer book. Um, I'm giving you some of the uh, service there. This is now summed up with, will you obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in them all the days of your life? And your, your response will be, I will, the Lord being my helper. But when I first started teaching this, we didn't have that prayer book. And I still like the way the 79 prayer book puts it. Because um, it says, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God and Christ? So that's a, a, in confirmation. Confir being confirmed, we're recommitting ourselves to be the sent out ones, right? That um, we want to share the love and grace of Jesus in all our lives, okay? Um, and then it's going to say, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Okay, let's say someone's an unbeliever, Um how 
is Christ in them? Okay, good. Made in his image and likeness, and Christ died for them, and that's their means to be brought back. So we believe, even if someone, like, if someone's not a Christian, does that mean that they're bad? No. Not at all, right? God created them. Jesus, you know, died for them. So we are um, being open to love everyone God puts in our path because he created them. And we trust that God is in control in ways we don't understand, and he's brought these people into our path. Not for us to curse them, but to bless them. Okay? Um, so loving our neighbor as ourself. And then will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Okay. So, this is um, right now there's kind of an alternative. You know, we talked about worldview before. So there's a worldview that's actively present that's disconnected from the Bible. Okay. Um, and it, this is it. Right. Um, they are all for this. Okay. Um, they, they want social justice for everyone. Okay, which, look, right here, we're acknowledging that's right, it's good, it's true. But you can't, we don't believe you can seek that apart from Christ. Okay, does this mean that um, if the government passes legislation so that everyone can um, be treated with dignity and respect, I should be against it? No, of course not, right? But I'm just wanting to make the, the case that um, in, in some ways this has been elevated to a point that you have to seek out um, this in every realm. And if you don't agree with it or agree with the means in which it's bringing about, you can immediately be lumped uh, with those who are causing the injustice. So you're immediately now lumped as an oppressor because you don't agree with certain ways that people are trying to liberate the oppressed. Does that make sense? Yes? No? All right. So um, the church is all for social justice. Don't get me wrong. But we begin with this very uh, similar foundation that we all are created in God's image and likeness, right? And Christ died for everyone. That's the foundation for us to seek, um, you know, that everyone's treated fairly, all right? So we have a lot to do in this area, right? Um, just to name, a sh like, so what, what are some areas where people are trying to, what, where our culture's stirred up right now because of injustice? Race. Okay, right. Okay, so there's race. What else? Okay, sexuality. What else? Immigration. Immigration. Okay. What else? Economic inequality. Economic inequality. I, I didn't hear. Male versus yep, male and female. Okay. So um, all of these things. Okay. So here's here's the challenge for us as Christians because on some of them, right, um, we need to we need to take ownership for how the church universal has been complicit with allowing some of these things to take place, okay? So, like, for example, our own denomination started out, you know, we'll see next week, the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States, right? We were here with the colonies, which means that inevitably we supported slavery in the Episcopal Church, right? I mean, there's just no way it didn't happen, okay? Um, so we have to acknowledge that. We also have to look at what can we do to address it in a way that honors Christ and honors our, our communities, okay? And just a few weeks ago, we watched um, a live stream uh, of a conference back in Washington, D.C., the Institute of Cross-Cultural Mission, uh, the Reverend Erwin Ince, um, you know, 
is an African-American pastor in the Presbyterian Church. He put it on just to look at, you know, some of these realities, okay? Because here's the truth. The church has not been persecuted in the United States, right? The church is losing its place of privilege within the culture, but we're not being persecuted yet, right? That may come, but we're losing privilege, okay? And so um, we as a church need to own up where we've done wrong and also to ask some difficult questions about how to move forward in a way that is glorifying to God, okay? So, but this means for us, right, um, like, let's just take the human sexuality piece. Uh, there was a time when the church went along with the culture, okay? And meaning that uh, the way people of same-sex attraction and alternative sexual lifestyles was treated in the culture was they were shamed, there was prejudice, they were hurt, um, and the church did not do anything. The church just kind of went along with it, right? And so then the culture changes, and the church is then flat-footed because they never actually said, what's a gospel stance to this? How do we welcome all people like the church is called to, right? Rather than, you know, what often happened, um, you know, not often, but you know, we had these horror stories of like when the AIDS epidemic was taking place, you know, um, at gay rights parades, right? You would have Christians out there holding up signs that God hates bags, yeah. that this is, this is judgment for your sin, right? Which to me is like, are you not reading the gospel? Are, are you not looking at what our Lord has, has done? But we need to understand then that there's a reason why the culture, you know, and people who have alternative sexual lifestyles don't want anything to do with the church, right? Um, I mean, that's not even a generation ago that this was taking place, okay? So all I'm saying is to be the called out ones, we have to really wrestle with our own sin and seek forgiveness and look at how can we take this good news in a way that meets people where they're at. And so it may begin with us first listening, first listening to people's experiences before trying to tell them what they need. Okay. Yep. Uh, Micah 6, 8 kind of wraps that up pretty well. Yeah. You want to share that with us? Yeah, and that, that's the type of fast God calls for in the Old Testament, right? Is that we actually, um, we, have to, we have to walk it out, right? Like there's a, a basic saying in recovery, you cannot transmit you, something that you don't have, right? So that's why worship's so essential. We, we need to continue to grow and be renewed in our faith so that we have something good to offer, right? Okay, let's move to the next one. All right, so uh, the hope in us. This is what Paul or Peter says in his first letter, third chapter. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Okay, totally different, transcendent, other, right? Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, okay? A sense of certainty, a sense of a, a future um, where like we can weather a storm because we know good things are to come even if right now it feels no bueno, no good, right? So a defense to anyone who asks you for the, a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So, um, this ties into our spiritual autobiography, right? Uh, you're being asked to write that to reflect on the hope that's in you, right? To, to reflect on what, what God's done in your life, to reflect on who Jesus is personally to you. 
Um, this is what we're called to be able to do when we're talking about sharing the gospel with others, is just to simply share who Jesus is, what he's done in our life, okay? And to do so with gentleness and respect, right? I don't, um, I have this story, I was in college and I was, you know, fail and actively failing out of college, actually, um, but I still went to campus and, you know, doing a lot of drugs, doing all these other things, and, um, you know, there was this either Campus Crusade for Christ or InterVarsity, you know, and someone, you know, a young guy came up and asked me, you know, kind of sharing me about, like, do you know Jesus? And, you know, it was what I referred to, um, and I still, like, I mean, I'm still sharing about it, so praise God. I mean, the courage of them, you know, to do this, but it was basically, this was the sense I got, right? Either you turn away from the way you're living or you're going to burn, right? Like this sense of, hey, you know what? Uh, there's a fiery pit and you're, you know, and, and here was my response. You don't know me. I don't think you care about me. And I think I'll enjoy the ride to that pit. Right, um, and that was kind of my my attitude. I wasn't a Christian at that time, but but I didn't. I it lacked the gentleness and respect. Right, gosh, it took courage and boldness to be able to stand out there and you know tell someone something that nobody wants to hear. And I suppose this is, you know, I think people have had that experience, and it was the right time. The Holy Spirit brought it together, right? And so I'm not saying God can't use that. I mean, that's in some ways kind of the essence of a lot of evangelistic kind of outreaches, right, is ultimately the way your life is heading is very bad, you can change it, right, as opposed to there's this beautiful, amazing God who has done this for you, right, um, what's blocking you, uh, but I think that that's the key thing is we need to, we, we don't want to cower in fear because we don't want to offend someone, but we also want to do it with gentleness and respect. And, and we should be praying, you know, little prayer, Holy Spirit, guide me as I share this. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, good. Because um, in a moment, we're going to prepare to go door to door. <laughs> no. That would be a good thing if I said, all right, so now, apartments cross street, here you go, share it. Um, but I, there's nothing wrong with that. There really isn't. I just think we have a, a lot less receptivity as a culture anymore to that type of approach. I think people actually want to, we, we should be in relationship with people regardless of what they believe. And it's out of that relationship, that willingness to be in relationship with our neighbors who may be very different from us, that we can then really share the life of Christ. Yes. Yeah, so that, that was our, my, uh, my first mentor in ministry, he, that's what he would tell me over and over. It was a church to the poor and the homeless. And th they were our church. Um, but he said, if you didn't hear it, uh, there was a duck in the back. Um, <laughs> that people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Right? And I think that's what this is getting at. Right? Because people know when they're in the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're not Mm-mm. Yeah, so very good point, right? He's talking, you can know the Bible inside and out and still miss Jesus, yep. right? And, and then what are you offering? Um, and I imagine that if he shared with people, it wasn't, you know, he, people felt like they got beat up after they left his presence. There was nothing there to give Yeah. All right. Um, so we want to know, right, the gospel, the good news of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Right, that God created us out of love. The design of God's eternal life is for us to be a part of his life, of his love, right? To be a part of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he had to give us the opportunity to choose that, right? If not, it would have been forced, and we'd been like little robots. Right? But Adam and Eve had a choice there in the garden. 
And, and they, the, the allure to be God rather than to be with God and to live in God's life was too great for them. And they chose to try to be God. Right? And that's all of our stories. That's what sin is. I'm, I'm continuing to try to live apart from God's love. Right? But God would not content to allow us to remain in that state. And so we see the whole story of the Bible is God as the main subject, us being the objects of bringing us back, not based upon our intellect, not based upon our finances, not based upon our race, not based upon our works, but upon his work and his love. And we see that on the cross. And so he overcame all our enemies and freely offers us the opportunity to return to that way of life, to that life. So that's the gospel. We want to know that. And then we also want to know our own story, how it intertwines with that. Okay? And so that's kind of the goal of that spiritual autobiography. All right, will you change it, Chris? Okay, now we're going to move into the idea of vocation and spiritual gifts, not vacation. Um, so vocation, right, is this sense that we have a, a specific calling in our life, okay? Um, I think we actually have multiple vocations um, that God has given us, multiple roles in which God has placed us, which in, in a real sense are our mission field, where we're called to serve, right? We often think of, hey, if I'm really going to be a part of that called out church, I need to be under bridges serving the homeless, or I need to be overseas letting people know about Jesus. And I think that really being the called out ones begins first right where God has our feet. How am I living this out in my home? How am I living this out in my workplace? How am I living this out in, in the neighborhood? Now, we are called to, to stretch ourselves and go beyond that, but not everybody's called to do that. Okay, so here we, we see Matthew. Uh, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. Right? That, that's us. We're actually the light of the world, he says. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people uh, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So our good works are the ways that we're just seeking to humbly follow Jesus. Right? So it's an overflow of our relationship. It's not a means to remain in relationship with God, right? It's just the natural being connected with Christ. We intentionally seek to be loving, okay? And the purpose of these good works is what? So that people will think, man, good Christian right there. Yeah, it's all about God, right? So our, our loving actions really don't have anything to do with us. They're about the people we're trying to love so that they can see God in us, right? When we lose that reality, we start to do good works for our own ego so that we can be great in the church or so that people will look at us and go, oh, what a good person, right? All right, and then the second one is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each, meaning every member of the church, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Okay, so there are spiritual gifts that are given. And the fruit of our lives, which we're called to live into, is referred to as the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? Peace, joy, love, gentleness, patience, kindness, respect, self-control. Probably missed a couple in there. But anyways, the point is, if I have a Christmas tree, beautifully decorated, the, the gifts under the tree, are they for the tree itself? 
No, they're for others. And that's what this is saying. God gives us spiritual gifts, but they're not for us. They're for others, right? And this is for the common good. It's about building up the church so that the church is healthy, so the church can go out and bless others and that the church can grow, right? In some traditions, spiritual gifts are the primary focus of so much. And, you know, from talking to brothers and sisters who are active in those traditions, it also becomes one of the greatest means of building up ego rather than blessing others, right? They, people can get so wrapped up on having spiritual gifts and using spiritual gifts um, that they start to think the gifts are for them, right? Um, you know, there's a common trend in all the ways the church expresses itself to have it go from being about God to being about us, right? That's why, once again, repentant faith, you know, the Holy Spirit's invitation, come home, is our pattern of life. All right, let's move to the next section. All right. So, this is a painting reflecting confirmation. It's a, a picture of actually an ordination. So that's a bishop laying his hands on a priest, ordaining him, praying for the Holy Spirit to fall upon him to do this work that he's been set apart to do. All right. I mean, then there's a picture of Jesus playing with little children. I love all paintings that have Jesus laughing because I think that they, they didn't maybe have humor right, you know, at the first century. Or, or, you know, it just wasn't adequate. But I, I know Jesus had a sense of humor, you know. And some of the things that he said, I think, probably caused people to laugh at that time, but we're just so far removed. But anyways, because um, I don't want to follow someone who's really stern and, like, oh, so serious, right? Do you guys? <laughs> all right. So what does this have to do with vocation and spiritual gifts? Right? We all have a calling on our lives. We're a part of the body of Christ. We're citizens of God's kingdom. We're his beloved children, right? We've been baptized. That's part of what baptism symbolizes. We've been adopted and brought into the family of God, okay? So we, we have this role, right? And, and we're already able to be playful around Jesus, okay? Um, if you guys can't laugh with him, just know he's laughing with you. So that might mean we're a joke, but um, I don't think he thinks that, so... Um, here we have this picture of the spirit coming and the fire, which re represents what took place at Pentecost. So at our baptism, or at a confirmation, the bishop's going to lay hands on you following the, the form of ordination and following the ancient practice. And like I said, he's going to pray, and he may get a word from the Lord, and he may whisper it in your ear. But it's really kind of like an ordination service. You're coming forward to say, hey, I am... I, I'm acknowledging that I'm a member of the called out ones, that, that I am called to actually share this love of Christ in all aspects of my life, okay? And so that's why we're praying for the Holy Spirit because to do this work, we need more of the Spirit at work, okay? And so let's go to the next one, Chris. Um, we're all called to serve, meaning that we have a vocation, the issue is not if, but where and how, okay? Um, and there's three things that we want to think about, and I have this here. There's some questions here that we haven't got to, but you can look over. We've kind of been addressing them. All right, so it says, where do you feel called to serve? Okay, and this is on our, our handout. It's the second to last page. Okay, so on the back you have the review, and here it says, where do you feel called to serve? Oh, Allie and, yeah, you guys don't have it, it's last week, that's next week, sorry. But so this is what it is, affinity. What pulls on my heart when I look around the church, the community, and the world? Okay, so God's, God's not going to call you to serve in a way that he's not already stirring up within your heart. Okay, so you, you, I want you to pray about this and write this. When, when you look at the church, where are ways in our congregation that you may feel called to serve, right? Um, when you look out in the community, 
well, how's God like pulling on your heart, right? Um, and when you look out at the world, right, there, there's things out there that God, you know, you'll, you'll feel a sense of this isn't right. Lord, maybe I can do something about it. So you begin by just praying about that and writing it down. Then ability, be honest with yourself, what strengths do I have and what weaknesses? How has God made me, right? I mean, if you're an extreme introvert, right, and you have a hard time talking with people, you know, you might not be called to personal one-on-one -on -one evan or like, you know, uh, evangelism in a sense of um, where you just kind of try to meet people just by scratch, right? Like, I mean, just kind of walk up to them and start talking to them. That, that might not be, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right? doesn't mean that we're not willing to be moved out of our comfort zone, but I think God's given us certain gifts and abilities so that when we engage in service, it's like life-giving to us. Like we actually feel like, oh, wow, this is kind of how I've been created rather than, oh, my gosh, that was such a burden. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. That happens in all of ministry. Right? We're going to get worn out, and it's going to weigh us down. But begin with what are your strengths and know your weaknesses. Okay, so what are your abilities that God's already given you? And then opportunity. Um, what do others see in me and what opportunities are available? Okay. So this is one way to begin to think about how God may be calling you to serve even in the next week or month. Okay. We often need other people to, to help us with discerning. Um, you know, we could do a spiritual gifts test, um, and those can be helpful, but sometimes if we're not really honest with ourselves, we're going to answer them in a way so that we have the gift we wish we had, but really don't. <laughs> and then the other way I've seen those things kind of fail is then, you know, um, there are certain things within the life of the church or the life of a family that you don't need a gift to do, right? The garbage still has to go out. But if I'm so focused on what spiritual gifts I think I have, well, no, that's not for me. I don't have the gift of service. Well, it's like, hey, guess what? That comes, that comes with being a Christian, okay? So um, I put, we're called to serve in church, in our home, in our daily life, and in the world. That's the way God's designed us, okay? Sometimes the way we serve is by writing a check, right? Especially if we're talking about things out in the world. But we're never called just to write checks, right? Our, our hands and feet are meant to get dirty because we're following the one whose hands and feet got dirty, right? Um, and then I put this, this is a great verse to remember, good verse to memorize, right? Colossians 3, 23 through 24, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So what Paul's telling them and us is that everything that we do, we should be doing as if we're doing it for Jesus, right? And we can really only do that when we know we're doing it with Jesus because he's in us, right? Okay. All right, let's go to the next one, Chris. I think that wraps it up. Okay, yeah, so your spiritual autobiography... Do we have any questions about that yet? Okay. So I need that emailed to me. Today's the 17th by the 20th so I can forward it to Bishop Eric. Okay. Like I said, um, it does not need to be anything really big. Uh, we're just focusing on, you know, um, you can share as much as you want about your past, right? If you're coming from another tradition, you can maybe share a little bit of, of your faith background and your traditions. But when did Jesus become personal? I mean, that's something to think about, how Jesus changes and influences your life today, right? So who is Jesus to you now? Um, you can define confirmation, and there's a definition in that booklet um, and why you want to be confirmed. Um, you can describe a little bit about Anglicanism. He's not looking for like, you know, I would just share what, what's drawn you to it, 
right? If you were raised up in it, you could share, right? Um, choice, not given, but this is what I like, okay? So for our young adult, you could share about aspects of Anglicanism that you like. Okay. Um, and then the importance of the creeds. Okay. Any questions on that? I've seen them be, you know, uh, as short as like, you know, six to ten sentences. Okay. So just kind of, and, and you can do as much as you want. I, um, but I think, you know, Less, less is often more. Okay, um, let's go to the next one. So here are our terms, church, mission, outreach, ministry, evangelism, vocation, spiritual gifts. Okay, um, real quick, what, what would you say is the difference between mission and outreach? Well, guess what? I've given you a definition. So... Um, but the way I usually think about it is the mission is, is specifically connected with the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Not just in deeds, but also in word, okay? Outreach is this sense of how we're seeking to love our neighbor and love the world, um, but it may not be at all connected, right? Like um, the gospel may never be shared, right? But mission, the mission of the church is that the good news of Jesus Christ goes out in word and deed. Okay, uh, Saint Francis, you know, he was a famous preacher. He said, um, you know, and I, I um, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Okay, he he's he's often attributed to saying that, but I talked to a scholar, or you know, he shared um, that he looked at all his writings that he had available and nowhere could he find that written, right? I mean, he, he, he started a preaching order. That's what the Franciscans were. They went out and preached the gospel, right? And so Paul says, if they, if they never hear the gospel, right, how can they respond to it, right? The, the good works, it, it helps people know that we care about them enough to where we can earn the, you know, the ability to have their ear to share the gospel. But if all we ever did was just good works, right, we, we wouldn't actually be living the mission of the church. Okay. All right, so those are the terms. Next one for next week. Okay, so review, summary and theological terms. Our reading from the catechism this week is Need for Atonement, Healing, and Joy on page 24 through 25. And for our practice, I want you to reflect and journal on where and how you feel called to serve. That's answering those three questions. Um, affinity, ability, opportunity, okay? Um, each day, try to be attentive of the simple ways you can bless others, okay? Just by saying a little prayer in the morning, God help me to bless others, um, is a good way to do that. And you know what, when we focus on blessing others more than on being blessed, um, we tend to have more peace believe it or not, right? Because if I'm focusing on being blessed, I'm going to be kind of anxious about whether it's happening or not. All right, in your service book, um, on page 73, that's the blue All Saints service book in the back, on page 73, there are three prayers for mission there. Um, I'm just going to encourage you to pray through them during the week. And then pray that God would give you natural opportunities to share the hope that you have within you. So basically, you're, you're praying that you might have the opportunity to share God's love with others. Okay. Any questions? Two weeks away. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you that we are, first and foremost, your beloved children, and that this came at a great price. Um, we, we receive it freely, but Jesus, we don't ever want to forget what it cost you. We thank you that we are the called out ones. And we pray that through our worship and through your spirit's presence in us, we would find joy and delight in service.
in, in serving within the church and our community and finding ways that we could be a part of your mission throughout the world. And we just lift this all up in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Okay.